So I've just started re the recording the session and let's go ahead and get started this morning. Welcome to TCDL, our first session. I'm so excited to be here. Um, so welcome to this session. It's our Birds of a Feather Accessibility and Digital AV Collections um, at the Texas Conference of Digital Libraries. My name is Cynthia Henry and I use the she, her, her pronouns. Um, I am the College of Human Sciences Librarian at Texas Tech University and um, I am the member of the TCDL Planning Committee. I am pleased to be your session moderator today. So just a bit of housekeeping. We will, um, we want everybody to do. notice, um, I'm dropping something in the chat. Um, Texas Digital Library and the TCDL Planning Committee are dedicated to providing an experience for everyone that is free from all forms of harassment and inclusive to all people. Um, so please note this um, message I dropped in the chat, and if you needed to read the code of conduct, it is linked there, um, and if you have any questions, just let us know. We'll be meeting until about 10.50, um, and feel free to take breaks as you need. Um, in, uh, in the days of in-person TCDL, Birds and Feather sessions were informal gatherings of like-minded individuals to discuss the subject um, without any strict agenda. Um, this form, format allowed the group to meet um, fellow practitioners and discuss approaches, successes, and challenges, and most importantly, build a community. Um, today's presenters hope to recreate the spirit of the birds of a feather um, in person. So there will be no presentation or slides today. Rather, we, they will be leading a conversation to provide attendees with an informal environment to share experiences and ideas freely. Together, we can continue to build a TDL community dedicated to accessible AV. So I'd like to say, um, feel free to drop your questions in the chat or say hello in the chat um, and let us know where you're from or uh, any share resources you would like to share. Um, feel free to unmic yourself and ask a question as we're participating in a discussion. Um, but I will be watching for your questions in the chat and share them um, with the speakers as well. So I am pleased to introduce um, uh, the speakers this morning, John Von Durant, he, him, his, from Texas A&M University Libraries, digital archivist, Kristen Clark, she, her, hers, uh, who works at Texas Women's University Library, Libraries, um, and she's a digital collections manager, Miracle Honk, um, he is from, uh, he, him, his, and he is from, uh, the University of Texas Libraries, Head of Preservation and Digital Stewardship, uh, William Hicks, who works at University of North Texas, um, the Head User Interfaces, and then Melissa Morrow, she, her, hers at Texas Tech University Libraries, Library Associates, um, Mark Phillips, he, him, um, his, also at University of North Texas uh, Libraries, Associate Dean for Digital Libraries, and Emily Vinson, she, her, hers from Houston, University of Houston Libraries, audiovisual archivist. Okay, take it away. Thank you very much. And um, again, good morning and welcome to this Birds of a Feather session, also on behalf of my co-panelists. Um, with this session, we, uh, to some extent, have come full circle. Um, about a year ago, a developer from UT Libraries, Kevin Price, and I presented on a then recently finished project that allowed us here at UT Libraries to publish audio and video material to our public-facing collections portal. And I touched upon our internal guidelines for captioning and transcribing content. This um, happened to spawn interest notably in Mark Phillips from the University of North Texas Library, and he suggested to establish a, a conversation on the platform of TDL around accessibility and digital AV collections to share knowledge <clears throat> and experience and to perhaps um, help to then further way to the case for accessibility beyond um, any aspects of legal compliance. Um, we held a kickoff meeting in October, 2021, 21, and we formed a steering committee comprised of colleagues from different institutions across Texas. And that is the panel members um, of today, largely 
um, comprised of colleagues from different institutions across Texas who use different workflows um, and technologies to make very different um, audiovisual content available to the public and provide accessibility measures for these collections. Um, our conversations have been inspired by um, a similar initiative uh, within the TDL space around web archiving. Um, our accessibility and digital AV collections working group is also not the first endeavor to investigate and learn about accessibility for library hosted content on the platform of TDL. Um, there was an earlier working group that performed a survey about accessibility in um, institutional repositories and published a very interesting report in 2019. And um, I believe we have a um, link to that report in our um, outline or agenda for today. Um, but we considered it timely and relevant to zoom in a little more for our current working group on audiovisual or time-based content that libraries and archives host and want to make accessible. Um, we created a mini series of two webinars that happened earlier this year, and those are available to re-watch, to watch or re-watch with captions on the TDO website. And um, you can provide links to these um, in the chat. Um, the first webinar covered um, foundational questions of why making uh, content accessible is important and useful. We cover technology, standards, workflows, as well as legal aspects. The second webinar featured some case studies from institutions that are represented in our steering committee. This Birds of a Feather session is the culmination of this mini series of webinars with questions for discussion that go beyond the kind of basics of fun, well, basics, the fun, fundamental questions that we had touched upon in the webinars. Um, our agenda for today, as we mentioned, is structured around um, some questions. Uh, the link's been shared uh, in the chat and is also on SCED. Um, we do also want to take some time at the end to discuss how or if we could continue this work in what form or frequency. We, um, as Cynthia mentioned, intentionally decided to not have slides. We do want this to be a conversation, not a lecture. Um, so we do invite you to watch the webinars again, uh, watch them or watch them again. Um, to learn more about fundamental concepts. At the same time, we do not want to discourage anyone from asking um, or discussing with us today, um, even if you haven't watched the webinars yet. So um, in other words, also don't fall for imposter syndrome. Um, maybe you're new to this conference, or maybe you're new to this field, uh, to this topic. The topic might not be considered high priority in your organization. Uh, we do not want anybody to feel bad about this. Um, this is an informal conversation among like-minded, friendly colleagues at different stages in their respective learning journey. So um, we invite you to consider this a brave space um, for learning and discussing. Um, so before I stop talking, I also want to uh, quick, uh, quickly thank the TDL staff uh, for their spectacular support um, throughout this past year and in general for being such an awesome and tremendously valuable organization. Um, so if your institution isn't already a member, consider membership. Um, with this, I would like to enter um, the discussion, um, but we do have a quick ask for. Um, we've created a survey about accessibility in AV, and I'm not sure if anybody on the panel might be um, introducing that survey. I think Courtney just dropped it into the chat, I but um, I can I can just say um, I think mostly it's just we're really interested in getting as many people to participate as possible, and so if we can learn more about you. Um, maybe we can find more, more partners to, to move this work along. So.
And then um, with that, we might um, delve right into the first question that we um, provided for today. How do you make this work, creating accessible AV content, happen in your organization? Or how is it not working? What are the blockers or where are you struggling? So we've got several larger collections of oral histories that have been transferred from reel to reel or from um, the regular cassette tape to digital. And so the quality is not such that we can use automated services in order to um, get those transcribed or provide any kind of captioning. In the case of one collection, there were original transcripts with those. And so we have digitized those and presented them alongside in hopes of making them accessible. But for things where there are no transcripts, we are at the mercy of, we just don't have anybody who we can sit and transcribe and we have no funding to send them to someone to professionally transcribe. So though I want them transcribed, <laughs> Um, the chances of that happening right now, it, as far as budgetary concerns, are low priority. Do a lot of people have sort of that like desire but no budget situation? I think that's a common experience. Very common. And I'm hoping for someday a graduate student, but the other thing that we have then is that, um, so these are oral histories from settlers here in Kansas. And um, there's some pretty problematic content in there. And we are an undergraduate institution. And I had one student a couple of years ago working on one and she's like, I just can't do this. I cannot listen to, you know, them talk about lynching a human being and then go on to talk about Christmas like it's nothing. And so it's not really a good candidate for student work because, I mean, there's some stuff in there that, um, you know, even professionals, we're going to have a hard time dealing with and putting that on students is a bit much, it seems. Oh, I don't feel like attending. I'm going to start saying have you investigated um, possibilities for grant funding around this? So we've been denied for about three different grants because at the end of the day, nobody cares about Kansas. Um, we are flyover country. And, um, you know, we have had a really hard time selling this collection as um, something that major grant funders want to, um, you know, fund. We do have some smaller state granting institutions, but the money that we could get from them would just be a drop in the bucket um, for what it would cost. Because I'm looking at, you know, thousands of hours of tape. This was a pro um, professor who was here who over the course of his 30 year career did nothing but collect interviews with people. And so um, right now I'm on 166 recordings, each of about two hours a piece. And that's just maybe a fifth of the collection. But if anybody knows of granting institutions who would be interested in this from an accessibility standpoint, I would love to, you know, I will try anything. I wonder about a state focus, like does, so in Texas, unfortunately I only know Texas, we have like um, TSLAC, Texas State Library Archives Commission, and they have some like text treasures grants. And that's, I think the money actually comes from um, IMLS, but it gets distributed to all the states and then the states distribute the money. So I wonder if there's, you know, it being so specific, I wonder if there's like a state-centric option. 
Um, there is. We've got the Kansas Humanities Council and the Kansas State Historical Society is the one that distributes the state IMLS funding. And um, we were on their list, <laughs> but even so, the amount of money um, we're going to get is still not enough to do to have the whole thing. But um, that's definitely on our radar and something that we are hope we're working with our funding office here to try and get those state grants because um, I don't know how it is in but other institutions, but here we have to go through our, it's our office of sponsor scholarship and sponsor projects. And they're the ones that tell us what grants we can apply to and when and what we can do with the money when we do it. Um, I'll chime in and say that here at UNT, we've hired a few students to work on transcripts and captions. Um, and when I've hired them, I do have a screening question for um, problematic content. Um, all of them have gone through and, you know, they've, they've said that they would be fine with it. Um, they tend to all be undergraduates, freshmen through sophomore. Um, they never on average from what I've seen so far work for more than an hour or two at a time. Um, and you get a lot more bang for your buck from work study cash than you are going to be from like a GRA. I mean, it's like a lot cheaper per hour. Um, so those are just a couple of things to think about if you're doing some of this work in, internally as well. Those are great ideas. Yeah, one other um, kind of observation that I've, I've found on, on these kinds of projects is it's it's really challenging to, especially with these large projects that you get discouraged because there's almost no possibility of one group funding the entirety of anything, right? But, uh, and, and I think that we kind of run into these like, ah, if you can't get the whole thing, it's not useful. Um, but, and, and so we found a lot of value up at UNT of, of doing pilots, working with our local administration to say, you know, we need $2,000, $5,000 to do a pilot, get all of the process. And so then once you have a process, it's a lot easier to, to, to show how, things are going to move from point A to point B, as opposed to saying, you know, we need the money to do everything and do the whole, like, start from scratch. And so um, that might be another option is to try to look for some local institution. And it doesn't have to be huge amounts. It can be just to show how the process works, show it from beginning to end, and then show the final product. And then there's a lot of, um, oftentimes, that's more, um, it's easier for people to see what the actual output's going to be. And I'll follow up with Mark too. Like you did say that um, your content is problematic and that you feel like it needs to be done by a human, but I, I would encourage you to think in terms of um, some of your content through um, AI generated systems as a triage type situation. Um, it's it's it, it, getting 60% or 70% or 80% accuracy is better than 0%. And you can always have students come back and fix those problems. Now that one, that one I can probably use. That's a great uh, transition to our next question, uh, which I'll go ahead and um, Courtney has put it in the chat um, about tools used. So um, just like William said, I think a lot of us who are on the steering committee find a lot of use out of using um, kind of AI tools as the first pass and then correction. So um, what have other people found useful? and what specific tool to be found useful. Hi, this is Cindy, can you hear me? Um, I'm at SMU and we have tried several things. I, I'm not trying to tell everyone this is the solution for you, but we put the video, we first started putting our oral histories into YouTube, getting the AI generated um, captions. And then we would spend a lot of time editing those. I know the AI is getting better and better, but um, we had to spend so much time. Uh, we do captions and then use that as a basis for a transcript. So the timings are another thing in addition to editing the Captions, you always have to, um, if you are very careful about it, you know, fix timings, et cetera. We have a one oral history project, which is very important. It's Voices of SMU with our underrepresented alumni. And so we were able to get funding and do a pilot with rev.com, which I know others use. 
And so that is a much better quality of transcript, ideally, and we do edit them, but I understand when people don't have time because it does take a lot of time to even edit those. So um, that's what we use. Uh, we find that editing the AI takes a lot more time. And so now we have videos up that haven't um, been captioned yet and we will try to get funding and get those done, but we're really focused on getting the new things Kind of like if this is going in, you need, we need some funding or some type of uh, captioning with it. So that's where we're at right now. Um, in the chat, Crystal asks, do you have a subscription and is it very costly? Um, I had the price, I'm assuming you're talking about rev.com and their pricing does go up. I. I want to say it's a dollar fifty a minute now. When I started, it was a dollar. So, but when we added the time, we were spending hours uh, fixing the AI. And if you really look at the cost to the university, you can make a case that it's just cheaper to uh, get it done at Rev. We've had we've had two hundred or so um, world histories captioned through Rev, and now they have recently reached out to me with the possibility of getting a discount because I guess that might be enough uh, business with them that we might get a discount. So I'm looking forward to that. And then every year um, we go to our friends of the library, They you can apply for different mini grants, anyone in the library can, and we usually get $5,000 from them. And this is a project with our history department. So they go to their dean and we just go everywhere with our cup out because really it has saved us so much time and the whole, uh, as we all know, these oral history projects are very time intensive, either on the production or the captioning or the post-processing, the metadata creation, et cetera. So uh, we're, we've kind of reached the point because this, is an important project for a lot of um, units in our university that if we can't get the money for Rev, we're just gonna have to really scale it back or um, wait until we get more money. So uh, I guess, you know, um, it is a bit expensive, but if you really look at the time and add up all the time that you and everyone else is spending, I guess in a way you can justify it that way. Can someone clarify what text ramp is for me? I'm looking in the chats. Sure, yeah, I put that up. Um, Texas, as of January of 2022, has a new security certification process for software as a service vendors. Um, and so basically any company that is doing business with the state of Texas has to go through this uh, certification process that says, yes, you can put Texas owned content on their servers, um, they meet certain guide, certain whatever uh, standards, um, and the vendor themselves has to do this. Um, I've talked like Rev is for sure on the list. If you go to their web, the TextRamp website from the state of Texas, they have a, a spreadsheet you can download of the vendors that are approved, and Rev is on there. Verbit, um, we know at UNT because we're entering into a contract with them, they've been approved. Um, but virtually no one else or no one else is. Three Play Media is a big player in this space. Also, um, I talked to their rep, and they are not yet. Um, a few other vendors like Trent and uh, whatnot. Uh, Trent will refuse basically to to get on. So if you're doing any business in the future, you have to sort of figure that part out as well. We've had other um, items dropped, other tools dropped in the chat. Um, Diane Lopez um, suggested that she uses Happy Scribe and has a link there and it works with different languages. Can 
Um, we are um, at time to move on um, with the discussion. Um, the next question is, what are your experiences with crowdsourcing of transcripts and captions? So it looks like that Mark dropped in Otter. Um, I don't know if that was still answering the old question or if that is also a, a crowdsourcing option for capturing captioning content. Um, but that's another one. I think Otter is what runs under Zoom for its captions as well, for the live captions. I don't think I've ever heard of any large scale uh, um, like, community projects. So um, it does seem like there's like a, in in um, contrast to like transcribing text, there's a bit of a learning curve that is required for AV transcription. So it'd be really neat to find out about some like projects to get like um, community active, you know, active in that sort of project. Yeah, I remember there used to be a, uh, um a process through YouTube where different, you know, communities could go around and go through and, you know, caption video content and local either initially do the captions, but do, or then do the translations into local languages that um, for better access. Um, I think there's also some kind of work in the, the podcast space around this, but not really associated with the libraries archives area. Um, but, but yeah, I don't, I don't know any larger projects to do the the AV captioning um, in a crowdsourced manner either. It's not captioning per se, but there is a, for audio description content, if you ever have to do that, um, there is a YouTube derivative called You Describe, um, and it just takes uh, videos from YouTube as a source, and uh, anyone can go on and create audio described versions of those, and they have a sort of a whole interface to record that through there. I think one challenge with a crowdsourcing project goes back to what um, I think Elizabeth was talking about earlier with um, potentially offensive content. And I think oftentimes with audiovisual content, we don't know what's on there. So there's no way to um, know what people are gonna run into. And so putting it out in the world <laughs> has like a little bit of maybe I mean, it depends on the collection, of course, but there is, I guess, a little bit of potential risk involved. You know, that's the main reason we don't put ours up on YouTube and use theirs to transcribe is because we have things that would just be taken down um, because the descriptions of racial violence, I mean, they very clearly <laughs> violate um, YouTube's um, service agreements. So it's just not an option for us. Elizabeth, are you making those available in your um, repository? Uh, no, they're not up yet. And those are still ongoing internal discussions about how available, we know for certain they're going to be available on campus. Um, but we're not, we haven't made final decisions about how widely accessible they're going to be. Um, they're definitely going to be searchable through abstracts and hopefully transcripts, but as far as the actual audio of them, um, we haven't made final decisions yet. Yes, I could imagine one possible option is to make the abstract or description available and then make it available on demand or something. Yeah, that's kind of the direction I think we're gonna, going to go. They're going to be fully accessible on campus because that's the point. It's a research collection. We want our students and our faculty to be able to use this collection. But, you know, we've got, um, it's not up yet, but we've got George Lincoln Rockwell came and spoke on our campus at the, you know, invite of uh, 
you know, a student group back in the 60s. And for those of you who don't know who he is, he's the father of the American Nazi Party. And his speech that he made here is everything that you would expect. And, you know, we've got these ongoing discussions. I'm one of those, we don't whitewash. We, yeah, it's pretty problematic that we had this guy come here and say the things that he said, but we don't get to sweep that under the rug. That's not helping anybody. Um, but on the other hand, um, to what extent does it have to be, you know, projected in its full form to the entire world? <laughs> Um, we definitely want people to know. We want be, people to be able to access it if they want it. But does it need to be out there for everybody in the brother to download? Yes, and you could make available maybe a clip of it or, uh, you know, a summary of what's discussed and then make it available um, just by getting dealing with someone in the library directly, I think that might be something. If I were projecting myself to be you, which I'm, I'm not, but um, that's something I might consider doing. Well, and you know, this is not the first collection we've had like this. Um, we have an alumni who went on to work very closely with the intelligence community. I was working on an oral history um, project two years ago, and. Um, we have this guy say, he's a former director of the CIA, say, now don't tell anybody this, but then talks for two hours. <laughs> and so trying to figure out, can we put that up? Thanks for sharing that. Um, and, um, yeah, before we move on to the copyright question, I might just um, say my two cents, which, which aren't like just my two cents. Like, I think there is a lot of discussion about this contextualization is key, especially if you make this kind of content available, you really, really need to provide context with it. So it just doesn't stand on its own. But um, we do want to move to the next question then. Um, and that is about copyright. Um, there are different aspects to this question. Um, how do we avoid infringing on copyright of the original scripts, writer, or the speakers? Um, do we infringe on their copyright and how do we avoid that? And under which circumstances might a transcriber or a captioner? rights and how do we acknowledge those or protect those if we need to. This is Crystal. I can say that we have a librarian who um, her focus is copyright. So anybody who has any copyright concerns, um, we always channel them to her. So we are fortunate enough to be able to um, really reach out to her as a resource. Um, I'll jump in and say that uh, not a total expert here, but I think that um, if you're doing this purely for accessible accessible reasons, that you're probably covered by the ruling under Hathi Trust versus the Authors Guild. Um, it basically found that like this is a, a legitimate use of of making a derivative copy, um, and you're probably safe. I think it starts to get a little squishy when you talk about like music lyrics and things of that nature, especially if you're putting it on YouTube, which there was there's an algorithm to take that kind of content down. Um, and you're going to have to explain yourself, I guess, to some owners, but you, if you want to fight for it, I think you have the legitimate right to do this. Yeah, you kind of, wait, are you saying that if you caption something, then it's a derivative work? I know, Marco, that's what I'm like, mm. because my other question is that was, I was thinking of, I'm not trying to just make muddy water here, but I was also thinking about our copyright officer for the library and 
like she can answer specific questions, but I haven't really taken the time to do like a policy, which was what would be useful to sort of try to capture, you know, so that the different nuances of each collection. I mean, I, again, I don't know, but I think that like if the purpose is to to make it so that blind, deaf users and other users with physical dis disabilities have access to equal access to the content um, and they don't have access to it in another way. And there are legal reasons why you need to do this, um, that a, that an original author doesn't really have a good claim. I mean, you're just you're you're making their words available to to a broader audience. You're doing them a favor in a lot of ways. Um, I mean, it, it, I guess it also gets squishy around the edges of like, if you're making a complete uh, verbatim transcript of a piece of content, or if you're doing some edits on it for clarity, which most of us will end up doing, like at what point does it you know, cease to be an exact copy and a derivative work? It, it's, there's just a lot there. Yeah, uh, I'll add here, this hasn't quite come up in terms of, um, like transcripts and uh, and captioning, we're at A and M. We're really just uh, beginning to move into this with our um, AV collections. But uh, we did have one collection. Uh, I think the first uh, collection of audio content and which were field recordings from done by a professor in the um, late '30s and early '40s and. Um, Included in that were um, he, he also was a doctoral student at uh, Iowa, and he happened to attend um, a function, and there were a um, writers workshop, and he recorded a well known, very a very famous American poet, and so we have these amazing recordings of this poet reciting his own work, and we reached out to the. Um, his estate and publisher and said we'd like to put them online and one of the first things they asked was are you going to have a print uh, a transcript of the work we said well we weren't planning on doing that at that point and so at this point we re I mean we're still waiting to hear back from them <laughs> and we haven't put that content online although some of the work is in public domain and some of it is not so I mean I think sometimes you just do have to uh, of course, respect the rights of the of the creator and copyright holder, and balance that with with what would be the the um, you know the the usefulness and, and of uh, for for um, research. Um, some of these some of these works are like these are the only known recordings of this of of this work. Um, also, and just seeing Emily's. Um, uh, content. We did have uh, a series uh, from uh, that was produced by WNYC in the 50s, and we reached out to them. It was a um, these were originally broadcast by the uh, Texas Forest Service, and we have the only known complete run of this radio series. And they said, we just said, Do you, is this okay? We're putting it up for um, uh, educational purposes, and we'll include. You know, you you're the owner of the rights, and to contact you for any other reuse, and they said that's fine with us. So again, we respected that use. Um, now we're not we don't have full transcripts of it yet. We haven't uh, approached them about that. But again, I think in terms of uh, copyright, it's it's always that's a good way to go. But also when you get into unpublished material, it's even it gets dicier, and um, but. But I think that uh, the the accessibility is not, you're not really changing the content; you're enhancing it. Waited seven seconds. Um, next question is um, How do you preserve accessible AV content? Um, do you preserve at all uh, the transcripts um, 
together with the audio, uh, how do you package that? Um, how do you handle changes to transcripts over time? Um, versioning is the keyword here. One thing we've been doing, or I'm excited about, we upgraded to, so here at University of Houston, we use Avalon and um, we have some like clever microsystems developed in-house to get our content both into preservation storage and to um, post online. And so now we, they're working their magic so that our um, um, caption files will be, go into our packages, our archival packages to go into preservation storage and Archivematica, which is great. And then we're also putting our, um, just as, as plain text, we're putting them into our institutional repository. So if people wanted to download them as a set, they could do that as well. But I am excited that we're gonna be proactively putting them in preservation storage, which is something we hadn't been doing up to this point. So at, uh, at UNT, we um, like the almost all vast, vast majority of the content, the captions and transcriptions come well after the content is ingested, moved to the preservation system, effectively forgotten about as far as like stuff in our mind. Um, and then at some point later, the, the captions will come. And so we're, we're taking a little bit different approach than trying to push all of that back into preservation packages, um, partly because of how our system's been developed. Um, but we do all of our, because these captions generally are all text-based, they work really well within a kind of text versioning system, software versioning like Git. Um, and we make use of a local Git lab instance where all of our captions go, which give us not only a basic editor for editing these files, it allows us to version things, it allows us to push and pull changes into various software environments and allows us to, you know, work within kind of our, our greater infrastructure, but also then provide um, versioning and a way to make, you know, accurate copies over multiple systems. And so we've, we've had some value in that um, over time. So content goes in, it gets into the preservation repository as the archival copies of the, the bit streams. And then at some point, captions happen and then that gets updated. We, we treat it in a very similar way as we do descriptive metadata, which will change over time. And so, you know, it, it will just constantly sit there and, and uh, accrue value and accrue changes um, as time goes on. Emily, um... I wanted to ask, sorry, this is Lauren. I don't have my video on. Did you um, say that you were putting the caption files in the institutional repository? I'm assuming yeah. the IR is separate from the special collections because that's an interest and that would kind of, I would assume that would be like, that That would then be preserved in the IR system. Yeah, so our IR is through TDL. It's uh -huh. the, help me out, the name of it is the, Something we call yeah. it an institutional repository, but it's through Texas Digital Libraries Consortium. I think I hope I'm not speaking totally wrong. Dataverse is the thing. Um, so um, D space. Thank you, Laura. <laughs> um, good to have colleagues in the chat. Um, so yeah, so it will be preserved again. And with our caption files, we're gonna strip. We're just using like a bash script to strip out the like time coding, so they're just text. So like if someone wanted to do like um, like text analysis on them is the idea with that. Oh, um, and maybe it'll never get used. It's like a test, you know, yeah. we have this huge grant. And so it's like this whole 3000 hours of stuff that we're, are going to have these caption files and that we're going to make available as a data set. And who knows what'll happen. Um, it's like, hopefully it put it out there and somebody uses it kind of situation, but. Gotcha. And well, also they're like, not that, much, hope. You they're put not it that big. There. So it's okay, you know, there's yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thanks.
Is anyone else preserving these or, or worried about not preserving them by contract? Are they just, do they only exist as captions? Which I think is fine too, if that's what you're doing. No shade. So just to echo on the the not these aren't that big, I totally agree. Um, and and I, I agree. No shaming of where you are. I do think it's one where you can make the case that these are really worth preserving, not only because content's worth preserving, why not? Or like, what are we doing? But um, especially when you just jump back five minutes ago or 10 minutes ago and we talk about the cost and the value and all of those and you know the investments we're making in these, um, it's probably some of the stuff that we invest the most in. <laughs> um, so we should obviously preserve it, but and the not very big, I agree. So looking at our, our collection, we've got 1.3 gigabytes of text. <laughs> so one gig. Um, and it's that's for 101,000 web VTG files, and so that's it, it's not that big in the grand scheme of things. I think the it's it's a lot of content file wise, and I think it just gets it's it's other stuff. Um, but it it is definitely something that I think is is worth having the conversation about and asking and kind of making sure that they're included in those discussions of of content. I think I know we're supposed to move along, but one other thing just to, to follow up on Mark is that also sometimes you get more information and it's easier to, that then you can correct something that like was really hard to understand before, but then you get more information. So maybe there's the opportunity to fix something. So like in my collection over and over and over, there's this chant that gets like played in the background and the like professional, we use through play media, professional transcribers transcribe it as human rights are here to stay, eat a pie and go away. And it is Anita Bryant go away, but it, the same mistake happens over and over. And if like, I didn't know it was Anita Bryant and someone figured it out 10 years from now, if you don't save those files, like, how are you gonna fix that? Um, so that's another great reason. If you have the ability <laughs> to go ahead and save things. Um, brings us to our final discussion question. Um, and um, this is where we're very curious uh, to hear um, from others um, how much value you see in this continuing and in what form this might be of value. We have um, started, uh, it's not, um, we haven't built on it yet, um, a wiki space on the TDL um, uh, Jira, no, Con Confluence instance um, that we could or plan to fill with some of the content that we've used to prepare the webinar series. The webinar series, as I mentioned, or the two webinars are available on the website um, for rewatching on the institutional repository, actually, not on the website. Um, and we have this birds of a feather session and the very interesting discussions that we're having right now. Um, how and in what form should we continue with this? Would you be interested in having more webinars or should we have other discussion sessions like these outside of the conference? I put this in chat already, but I just want to say it out loud because I'm so excited about it. We were we created the survey in order to try to find out how TDL can be more of, of service to our members um, with regard to AV accessibility. And so the fact that y'all have more than doubled our data during this session is so meaningful. Thank you so much for that. It'll help us move these conversations forward when we when we reconvene as the initial group.
Okay, I guess that brings us to the end of this discussion. Thanks for everybody for participating. And I can't wait to see y'all all at our next sessions. Um, you have about 10 minutes to get to your 11 o'clock um, um, session starting. And yes, let's give the speakers a round of applause. Good job, guys. Um, it was a really nice led uh, discussion.